So as I was uh, traveling here and there, uh, moving around, I'm so glad to finally come back and have some peace or some solidity. And despite uh, going through other ups and downs more in life, some turbulence, but I'm also grateful that uh, there's a place that I can call home to come back to. Uh, that is using my breath as much as I can to re-anchor myself. And I believe all of us here would also know how to return to ourselves no matter what uh, is happening. Whether it's um, something happening in society, something happening in our environment, or in life, at work, or just about anything, right? Wherever we go, we can always reconnect with ourselves simply by coming back. And the Sangha is just here to remind us that there's a home that we can come back to by taking a breath to return. So in life and in practice, it's the same thing, isn't it? We can wish for something to happen. We can want something, but it requires us to take the right step, the right approach. And that is where effort comes in. The parami of Uriya, which is called the perfection of diligence, effort or energy. Sometimes we can feel depleted or exhausted because we give our energies to things that don't actually require the right kind of attention. Many things can happen in our lives, but where are we placing our attention on? We can intensify certain feelings or certain situations by playing scenarios in our head or adding narratives to them. And that's where our energy goes. And that's how sometimes we can feel uplifted and sometimes we can feel extremely drained. I know that most people have great responsibilities, things to do, things to complete, things to fulfill. But, and you have to put your energy into them. But how about times when you're not engaged in those activities? Take for example, you have a social gathering to go to that you might be excited about. Once you've made a choice, you make a decision to go, then I think we should be over and done with it and place your attention somewhere else because that event has not happened yet. But if you go on thinking about it, that means that you're wasting your energy and that's how you can throw yourself off from the center. So this is also my own personal practice, uh, going through certain things and difficulties in my own life, right? Um, but I'm so aware when to just put it aside. You see, this is not suppression or avoiding the problem, but this is knowing very well what you're doing right here and now. What are you being engaged in? There might be a lot of things to solve, to resolve, or to work, to work through in life but you can only do one thing at one point of time. So when you are away from your responsibilities or events where your presence is required, what are you doing? Where are you dwelling? Are you dwelling here? Are you dwelling in the future? So as we practice more and more, we learn all sorts of things. Anapanasati, Sadipatana, Mita, Karuna, and all kinds of practices. Sometimes we may forget. And the simplest thing is about how can we be here and now? How can we be present? And look at our sankharas. Sankharas are also our mental activities or mental impulses. What are we doing? See, mental impulses are not, they don't just push us to do certain things, but they push our attention somewhere. Because it's called the mental activity. It's happening on the mental level. They can push you to think or play out scenarios of the future. And that's where anxiety can come about, even fear, resistance, anger, or even overexcitement at times. And we know that the more you think about something, the more expectations can come about. And that's expectation, you cling onto expectation, which might not reflect reality. That's where we start to have mental suffering, dukkha. Means you don't have a total well-being, right? Suffering is a very loose word. So we use like, is there well-being in your mind at that point of time? If there isn't, then that's where dukkha or suffering is present. And what do we do about dukkha? 
So it's not so much about the event or about your likes and dislikes, what you want, what you don't want anymore. It's about dukkha. Dukkha is appearing in your life. Right at the moment, how are you going to understand dukkha? Where is it coming from? Is it driving you? Is it spurring you forward? Or is it holding you back from actually having a total well-being here and now? So well-being, everyone seeks well-being, happiness, peace. And some can even visualize or envision a life without suffering at all because they think that it's a total well-being. Everything will be smooth sailing. You'll be zen everywhere you go. Of course, that's an ideal. If we, if we get from, from the Buddha, we can peace all the time. But the Buddha lived presently in the here and now. Are we living presently? Can we accept that as long as I have well-being here and now, that's enough for now, for this moment. See how we can carry it forward to the next moment. And that's where we can remain mindful and focused. So there are two things that can support our life and our attention. Number one is Unisomana Sikara. So Unisomana Sikara, it means skillful attention. Where are we directing our attention? Mana Sikara is attention, and Yoniso means skillful or wholesome, or it can be translated as wise. The wise attention. Then the opposite of it is called unskillful attention. So Yoniso Mana Sikara is something that we can train. Place our attention on things that nourishes us. And what nourishes you at this moment? Perhaps being grateful that you're alive, you're healthy, you have a practice, you have a sangha, you know how to breathe, you know how to catch your thoughts, you're in a comfortable dwelling, what's going well in your life, things like that. That's Uniso Manasikara, wise attention. Because our minds and our consciousness needs to be nourished. We want to get used to nourishment. Because in society, we are so used to beating ourselves up. We are so used to damaging our minds and our consciousness. We are so used to being distracted by our own impulses or even the impulses of others. That's why suffering happens in the world, as we can see today. Wars, political turmoil, and all that kind of stuff. Now, other than Uniso Mana Sikara, there's also one more thing we call Parato Gosa. Parato Gosa, it means mm, to see things with openness, with a beginner's mind, to accept things, that there is something in everything that we see that can nourish our consciousness. Nourishing our consciousness is a way of cultivation to learn to let go of our defilements, our mental afflictions, so that we can reveal the Buddha nature within us. We can shine brightly. Mindfulness gets sharpened that way. And we know how to improve our quality of life. So they come in together. See, earlier when I talked about Yoniso Mana Sekara, or why skillful attention, to put on the attention on the things that can nourish your consciousness. Right? Makes you feel full, makes you feel whole, perhaps it will make you feel more positive. And that gives you an understanding of how you relate to the world or so-called reality. Because we form our own reality by giving meaning to things. Right? But it should not always happen on the intellectual level. We want to go with a sense of feeling. How am I feeling this moment when I encounter life? Am I peaceful or am I not peaceful? Is there well-being or is there to come? And how Parato Gosa comes into play is that when there is suffering, when there's something that's not going well in your life, something sudden happens, and then it requires full attention in that moment, but it's a situation that was unforeseen, undesirable, and perhaps you just want to remove that situation, but you can't because you're accountable to it. That's where Parato Gosa comes in, that openness, that inspection. 
to welcome it. And when that comes in, it becomes skillful attention because you know that you can learn something about yourself or about the world in that moment. That can nourish your consciousness. It can give you insights into life. It gives you insights into the nature of suffering, of why we suffer. You can see into the cause of suffering, which, is, uh, which comes from our attachments, our own wishful thinking of wanting everything to go our way. And when we can let go of that attachment, that's where we're liberated from suffering at a point of time. Your own enlightenment shines again. So that's how Yoniso Manasikar and Prado Gosa, they come in to play together. So be it in life or in meditation, we also know that everything is very transient. Mind is different all the time. Right? It has its own mood swings. Sometimes you want to meditate, it doesn't want to meditate. Maybe sometimes you want to practice loving kindness and it just doesn't want to go there at all. You want to just sit down in peace, it doesn't want to. You want to visualize wanting or whichever Buddha, it just doesn't want to, it resists. Then what are you supposed to do in that moment? Do you just lie down and go to bed? Do you stand up? Do you force yourself to just practice loving kindness even though your mind doesn't want to? So the thing is that, is to look at that situation. What is really happening? How's the body feeling? Are you really tired? Have you been getting enough sleep? Have you been eating right? So mindfulness can coat your body to a full kind of awareness that gives you an insight right in that moment of what's going on. What was your mind turbulent before that? Was it lacking loving kindness? No, this and that. So that's very basic mindfulness. But after that, you apply your means. So Manasikara and Prata Gosa, you go into it. Like, why can't I sit? Is that suffering because I can't sit still? Are my impulses pushing me somewhere else because I'm afflicted by something that was going wrong in my life that I just want to toss everything aside? So that's what introspection is about that we can look inward. What is brewing within us? Are there sankharas, are there impulses driving us? Even here, when you're sitting right in this moment, what is going on? So in order to understand the world, we have to understand ourselves, we really have learned to master ourselves. And then a new world opens up again. Everything that you know of, or you think you know of, it changes, it shakes. I believe that some of you have ex experienced that, no? talking to some of you as well, in the recent weeks. Or any kind of intellectual understanding or concepts that you have, or past insights about practice or what Dharma is. Sometimes they just don't apply in the present moment anymore because they're just insights of the past, they become perceptions. What is practice at the end of the day? So Parato Gosa have that, gives you that openness so you can place your attention skillfully again with wisdom, with understanding. In the forest tradition, I was trained and taught in such a way that every time you practice, you, you, you toss everything out of the window. You don't have any fixed views of practice. You also don't have any unfixed views about the fixed view of practice. You know? That's the trap of the ego, thinking that you know everything, thinking that we, have, we, we are so wise, that we have a practice, we've been practicing for years. But sometimes it's just a comfort zone of where we're dwelling in. <laughs> you can't step out of it. Sometimes we try to validate our own experience by going to teachers, books, or referring to our past experiences. And why do we want to validate it? Especially when we, it has really been validated, when we really felt good about ourselves because we have some transformation and insights that we applied into our lives. But why do we keep referring back to them? You see, there's insecurity, there's doubt, one of the hindrances, one of the five hindrances that prevents us from diving deep 
into meditation. So faith is something that's important. Faith or sadha is the kind of confidence that comes from within, that has gone through enough in life, and to know that what I'm doing now is right. This is proper and appropriate. Then when you are really convicted to the fundamental truth, doubt, suspicions, and insecurities cannot come about. Because you know why you're here. You know why you're feeling what you're feeling. You know why you have certain thoughts. You know what you ought to do in this moment. Simply by placing the right attention first. And that's how the true practice can kick off. Some people think that, oh, uh, because they're so used to their habitual patterns, and they just think, ah, no, I'm going through some things in life, I need to hide away from the whole world. The more they hide away from the whole world, the more they realize that they're hiding from the truth of themselves. <laughs> because everything turned into a form whether you try to validate experiences from someone or you try to make sense of what you're doing by hiding away, it just becomes another trap of the past. So it's how we can adopt a true open mindset to actually step out of our shells and step into the world for us to arrive. We've been practicing together for a long time, or even maybe for many lifetimes. We've read enough books, we've listened to enough Dharma talks, we've listened to enough sharings, we've tried enough practices. We have studied enough esoteric uh, articles, teachings, just so much, right? You have gone in meditation, but just about practice, your own tantric practices, Rishi, Metsa, Buddha. Uh, other kind of Taoist practices, Hindu practices, Christian practices, secular practices, astrology, numerology, uh, and even anagram for some of you, uh, all sorts of stuff, right? Just pendulums, symbols, you can go on and on and on, right? Even in terms of Dharma, you have mindfulness, meditation, um, loving kindness, anapanasati, vipassana, blah, 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 blah. Right. Just so much. And these are just frames of references for us. And what's most important is your own essence. What is practice? What is life for you in this moment? How can you have a greater sense of well-being by accepting anything that appears? without latching onto them, without being carried away by them, not even the idea of healing and transformation. Because while we were conserving our, okay, take for example, studying, learning, meditating, reflecting, contemplating, you're harnessing your, your power within. But power can't just be kept inside because you don't just live inside of you. You live in a world that goes beyond in and out. Like you sitting here, your life, life is in you. But you witnessing everything that's happening now with your ears and your eyes, it is life happening outside of you. You can't say there's an inner life and an external life because you're experiencing both at the same time. Like right now when I'm thinking, you are reflecting. See, something external is happening. And you're aware of something eternal that's actually going on. Uh, there's no two separate worlds. It's just life that is happening. So having harnessed your own understanding, you know, how are you stepping out into the world? You see, when you are learning on a path of transformation, the world outside you was changing. Maybe you were starting something this morning. Could be anything. Right? In the morning when the sun was up. And you're done starting and now the sun is up. You see, the world has changed. Right? 
So how, how can we apply these things by being in touch with reality? The true reality that goes beyond our own perception and our thoughts. And when we can truly arrive by using our physical environment practice, doesn't matter whether you're in nature at home or in a social situation, right? When you can truly arrive with Parotogosa and Yoniso Manasikara, then your awareness naturally flows within and outside of you. And that's where your own knowledge, accumulated knowledge, can drain out. Because it has to drain out. And where does it drain to? If your mindfulness, it seeps into everything that's around you. And that's where the Dharma can become alive. You know what you ought to do in that moment. And that's where things become truly spiritual again. And you find your place. So in meditation, it's the same thing. So we say that you're just, not just sitting with the physical sangha, but your environmental sangha as well. You close your eyes, you breathe in. You know who well why you're here. Maybe you have an idea that you want to work on your inner child, you want to work on your mental suffering, you want to work on raising your vibrations, you want to work on restoring yourself so that you can step back into the world. But is that what you really need to do? Is that uh, congruent with what is going on within and around you? And what we actually have to do is simply to let go, throw everything out of the window. Because meditation is about meeting yourself, understanding yourself here and now. If there's suffering, you deal with that suffering. So that's what the Buddha said. You need to uh, teach two things and two things only, which is dukkha or suffering and the end of dukkha. That's all he, that's all he thought. And he didn't say go look for dukkha to end dukkha. He didn't say that. He said, I teach the nature of dukkha, means when dukkha arises, which is part of the human life, then I teach you how to end it, right? But when there's no dukkha, what does he do? So in the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha said, he has not taught one word of the Dharma. What does that mean? So when you sit, when there's no dukkha, you just sit, you just enjoy, because you can rest. And when dukkha arises, you approach it with tenderness, kindness, compassion. And that's about all. That's how we can achieve a mental equilibrium and we start to recognize this state and we build it into a repertoire so that we can do our best to apply it into our day-to-day -day life so that we know how to set things aside where we need to, we can know how to direct our attention wisely.